from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 39, recorded on May 7, 2024. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Typically, Paul writes a column a week, and we try and talk about it here on video shortly thereafter. And today, we're going to talk about Paul's recent column, Connecticut Stands Up for Its Children. So you start by writing that the U.S. eliminated measles in 2000, but why are we having cases of measles now? Because a critical percentage of parents have chosen not to vaccinate their children, and they've made that choice because they can. Although there are school mandates, and it was those school mandates and the enforcement of those school mandates that largely caused us to eliminate measles from this country, there are pop-off valves. You can choose to exempt your child from vaccines for philosophical reasons or religious reasons. And for that reason, we're now seeing uh, measles come back. So if you have a religious or philosophical objection, you don't vaccinate your child, can they still go to school? Yes, they can still go to school. That, that's the, the school mandates um, were, there, are, there were a couple states like West Virginia and Mississippi, um, that at least a few years ago only had medical exemptions. So if you if you wanted to go to school, you had to be vaccinated. If you chose not to be vaccinated, then your choice was either to vaccinate um, or to homeschool, uh, which is you know which is financially burdensome, uh, emotionally burdensome. So I think um, as a consequence, those two states, Mississippi and West Virginia, had the highest vaccine rates in the United States. And as a consequence, had some of the lowest rates of vaccine preventable diseases. And those are not states known for their their public health initiatives. So it, it shows you that mandates work. Yes, if you choose, if you if you don't have a religious or philosophical exemption in a state that has school mandates, you have to be vaccinated. It seems to not make sense to me that Schools mandate vaccination because you want to prevent transmission in schools, right, where a lot of kids are in, are in rooms together. It seems to me that if if parents don't want their child vaccinated, they shouldn't be allowed to send them to school because that, that breaks the whole system, right? Exactly right. So that's what's happening. So now that you have these so-called philosophical religious exemptions, you have outbreaks. And I think what happened, for example, in 2014, 2015 in Southern California there was an epidemic of measles, and there was that was a state that had a religious exemption, and that 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 outbreak spread to 25 other states. It involved hundreds of people. There was one associated death, and as a consequence, a state senator named Richard Pan decided to eliminate uh, the religious exemption in California, and and he did that. It wasn't easy, and but with that, you would see then an increase in um, in vaccine rates. So, what exactly is a religious Exemption. Well, so so what you're arguing is that on the basis of my religion, I'm choosing not to be vaccinated. And and there are a couple arguments that could be made. So, for example, there are some vaccines made that use porcine gelatin as a stabilizing agent. There are religions that that forbid um, the ingestion of of pig products. So you could argue. Um, I don't want to get a vaccine for that reason. Now, now the major policymaking bodies for those religions have weighed in on this issue and said it's okay to get vaccinated. The, the, other, the other issue would be um, there are two cell lines, MRC5 and WI38 cells, which were elective abortions performed in the early 1960s that, that were used and are used to make the rubella vaccine, the hepatitis A vaccine, one of the rabies vaccines. So you could argue... My religion, Catholicism, says that I shouldn't, um, you know, that an abortion is a sin, a sin worthy of excommunication from the Catholic Church. So, therefore, I don't want to get vaccinated. Now, the, the Catholic Church has weighed in on this. They have 
uh, something called the Pontifical Academy for Life, which has weighed in on this issue. At the time, Joseph Ratzinger was the head of that uh, body. He eventually became Pope Benedict XVI. And although he was very much opposed to the fact that those cell lines were used, he wasn't opposed to the fact that nurses and doctors would would give those vaccines and that, that Catholics could receive those vaccines because the goal of these vaccines is to protect children and keep them safe. And that is also the goal of the Catholic religion and, frankly, every religion. So he said that it was okay to do that. Do you think that parents are actually concerned about what their religion allows or they just want a choice and are uninformed, unfortunately, in, in the choice that they make? I think the, the, the most people who choose a religious exemption do it because they, they can and not because it has anything to do with their, their religion. I mean, if you look at what happened in Mississippi in July of 2023, when they, they said, OK, now we're instituting a religious exemption, 2,100 parents immediately chose that exemption for their children. I, I think probably few of them, for, for few of them, it was really a religious issue. It was just a convenient way out. And that that's what bothers me in this. I can tell you when, in 2009, when the swine flu uh, pandemic hit, our hospital required a vaccination for among its its healthcare staff. And we didn't allow a philosophical exemption, but we did allow a religious exemption. And for at least that first year, I was in charge of that religious exemption. And all I said was, if you're choosing a religious exemption, please show me where in the major text of your religion it says that you shouldn't be vaccinated. And what I got was a lot of sort of notes from yoga instructors, but nothing from those major texts, which obviously were written well before vaccines, which weren't really available till the late 1700s. Yeah, that's always been my problem with religious exemptions because, as you say, the texts are ancient. They predate vaccines. So, And then people say, well, my religion doesn't permit me to put anything foreign into my body. And then, then what about the food you ingest? You know, that's pretty foreign. It doesn't make any sense no matter how you look at it. Now, in Missouri, why did this uh, exemption get um, eliminated? In July of 2023, uh, Mississippi reinstated their religious exemption. It was the um, efforts of a lawyer who worked for a virulent anti-vaccine group called Informed Consent Action Network, who saw this as an issue of freedom. And when, with the, the continued lobbying of legislators um, and with all the money that was behind that effort, they were able to institute a religious exemption and declared, you know, that uh, now freedom of choice is one. Well, freedom, freedom basically to put children in harm's way. There is no doubt in my mind that with now just this first 2,100 parents are choosing not to vaccinate, I'm sure more will follow. And Mississippi will once again fall back into the realm of those other states in whom measles outbreaks are occurring. So freedom, freedom to what? Freedom to put children in harm's way? It just doesn't make any sense. So ICON is really about freedom or do they sell something that they make money from? Well, so the Informed Consent Action Network, like most anti-vaccine groups, often has a connection to, to you know, the alternative medicine industry and dietary supplement industry and who funds them? I, I can safely say that their funding has dramatically increased during this pandemic because this has become, to some extent, a political issue. Somehow the notion of freedom from vaccinating has become a right-wing issue, and they get, I think, that kind of support. It's certainly true that their money has dramatically increased. And if you look at the so-called disinformation dozen, as described by the New York Times and the Center for Countering Digital Hate, of those 12 people or groups who are um, sort of promoting anti-vaccine uh, messaging, most of them are supported at some level by the alternative medicine industry. All right, what happened in Connecticut with respect to religious exemptions? Right, so so thanks to the legislators and thanks to the public health officials, they overturned their religious exemption, thus once again uh, making that state, and it's true now for, for New York and for California, um, uh, that 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 and Maine, that now um, there's only a medical exemption to vaccination, which puts those children in a much safer position. It's it's you know it's hard to, to, to watch this, frankly, Vincent. I mean, there's so much in medicine that we don't know. There's so much we can't do. I mean, this we know. We know that we know that measles can can kill you. I, I mean, you know, I'm a child of the 1950s. I had measles as a child at a time before there was a vaccine, which wasn't until 1963, where there'd be three to four million cases of, of measles a year 
year. There would be 48,000 hospitalizations of measles a year. There'd be 500 deaths from pneumonia or dehydration or encephalitis. And then much more rarely, a, a chronic infection of the brain called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is invariably fatal. And we just don't realize that. I think that we... Um, we we have taken these vaccines for granted. I think these vaccines have been a victim of their own success. I think we don't, not only did we don't see measles as much anymore, but we don't remember measles or how sick it can make you. So let me understand. So in Connecticut, there was a law in place permitting a religious exemption. Is that correct? Yes. And then the legislature overturned that law. Right, because they wanted to protect their children. The same thing happened in New York. I mean, there was a religious exemption to vaccination in New York. That was overturned. Same thing in California. Same thing in Maine. But I think what's happening now, my prediction is that you'll start to see these exemptions being put back in place because there's an enormous effort, an enormous monetary effort, not from religious groups, not from Catholic groups or Jewish groups or Muslim groups, but from anti-vaccine groups to basically allow this so-called freedom to, of choice, freedom to choose to put your child, your child's in harm way with no benefit. I mean, the measles vaccine is safe, it's effective, and it prevents against disease, a disease which can be devastating. And now you're seeing, you know, over the past few years, you know, almost 350 cases of measles in this country. You get to a few thousand cases of measles, and once again, we'll see children die of a disease that they don't need to die from. And I think the thing that's, that's, that's the most upsetting about this is it becomes a statistic, right? I mean, there's the old Stalin line that, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And we're always dealing with the statistics. And I think that, that, that there are, there, if we get to, a few, to two, 3,000 cases of measles again, and we see measles deaths again, those are going to be in people that have names. And we don't know their names yet. And maybe if we knew their names now, we'd feel differently about what we're doing. The states you named that uh, overturned religious exemptions to vaccination, they're, they're all relatively politically liberal, right? And so I cannot see that happening in, in states that are politically conservative. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Yes, no, I think the opposite is true. I think for those states that don't have religious exemptions that are conservative, you'll probably start to see them being put in place again. And I think part of it also was the mandates that were associated with the COVID pandemic over the last few years has created this real sort of libertarian backlash against mm -hmm. any sort of what is seen as, as government overreach, although I would be see this as an example of either state or local or federal governments sort of caring for its population. You can imagine that uh, a candidate could use it as a platform to try and get votes, saying, here, this state, your legislature has eliminated your freedom. I'm going to give it back to you. Right. There was, when, when California overturned their religious exemption, the, because they were the center of that 2014-2015 measles epidemic, and a guy named Richard Pan, who was a state senator uh, in Sacramento, in California, who also was a pediatrician, um, he stood up for this and, 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 and was able to successfully eliminate the religious exemption. There was one moment in, in those, uh, those cases, because they went before um, a series of uh, um, uh, hearings, there was a, a little boy who stood up in front of all the anti-vaccine activists. He was, he was maybe five, six, seven years old. His name was Rhett Crowett, and he had leukemia. He had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And he stood up and he said, I have leukemia. Um, I can't be vaccinated. I depend on those around me to protect me. Don't I count? And to me, he was the voice of society, and he was a powerful voice. This little boy was a powerful voice, and I think he had a lot to do with why they were able to successfully overturn that religious exemption. I can imagine some people who are so hardened, they wouldn't pay any attention to that, though. It's really sad. All right, you can read the original column on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.